Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Each spring, the Christian Ed Department takes responsibility for two special chapels, Issues in Christian Education. This is the first of those two chapels, and today is something very special for you, and I'll be telling you more about that in just a moment. But tomorrow, uh, we focus on the students of Dallas Theological Seminary, and they are going to be sharing with you one of uh, the presentations that they made in a teaching process course. And so I urge you and your friends to come and to see some of the marvelous creativity exhibited by the students here at Dallas Seminary. We will, be, we will be meeting in Lamb Auditorium for that, and I have never been to one that I did not enjoy, so I encourage you to come. Today, we are blessed to have a friend, a colleague, a, a minister of the gospel, and a professor, uh, Dr. William R. Rick Yount. There are many reasons to be impressed with Dr. Yount, one of which is just simply trying to lift the Vita that I received uh, from him, all of the different things he has accomplished in his life. But just one, his current responsibilities as professor, chairman, and assistant dean for the Foundations of Education Department at the largest seminary in the world, our sister seminary in Fort Worth. Southwestern. Heavy responsibilities. We were agonizing together about uh, the limitations those administrative responsibilities put on us, those who love to teach. But in addition to those things that impress us, there are even more reasons to be fond of Rick. For example, he has a deep and abiding love for the church. He's concerned that the church do a better job of educating its people. He himself has served on a number of different church staffs trying to assist and to help in that. Of course, he has contributed to the field of Christian education. He's the author of a number of books, one of which, Created to Learn, is a textbook in our courses here at Dallas Seminary. He has an international concern. Uh, Rick and I have actually chased each other all over Eastern and Western Europe. Uh, when I'm in Moscow, he's in Ukraine. I get to Moscow, he's in Bonn. When I get to Bonn, he's back in the Ukraine. And uh, so we, we uh, have had a great time and, and a great friendship of, of thinking about how to help the church worldwide develop in Christian education. But the most endearing feature of all for me and knowing Rick is this one tiny item slipped in here. Between 1973 and 1976, he had a ministry to the deaf. As I thought about that personally, I, I believe that I myself have had a ministry to the deaf almost every time I preach. <laughs> Rick, we are glad that you're going to come and speak to us today. We are grateful for the extra time you're going to give us in the brown bag following for those who have questions. And I trust that your ministry today will not be a ministry to the deaf, but rather a ministry to those who are alive and listening. And would you help me welcome our friend and our brother in Christ, Dr. Rick Young. Well, it is a joy to be with you this morning. <clears throat> My life uh, has been greatly graced by Dallas Seminary. <clears throat> For years, I've been influenced by the, excuse me, <clears throat> writings of uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks, and am glad to hear the good report about his surgery. Dr. Ken Gangle has been a great influence on me. Dr. Michael Lawson through his writings and through his friendship. Got to know Dr. Lawson through our association with the NAPSI organization, North American Professors of Christian Education. I've shared a couple of cups, cups of coffee with Dr. Mike Heineman. Uh, Mar Did I say Mike? Well, I know your name is Mark. <laughs> Mark Heineman, uh, as we talked about a research project that he's heading up with some colleagues. Um, one of your newest Christian education professors 
is Dr. Jay Sedwick. I was the research and statistics portion of the gauntlet that he survived on his way to his PhD mountaintop in student ministries at Southwestern. He did a great job on his dissertation and I know you're proud of him. The newest professor in our division is Dr. Octavio Escada, one of your graduates. He's doing an excellent job teaching courses such as philosophy and history of education, principles of teaching, and the teaching ministry of the church, and he's sitting right there. Do you want to stand and wave at the folks? And finally, one of our December 2007 PhD graduates in Foundations of Education, Dr. Jennifer Perkins, is a graduate of Dallas Seminary. Her dissertation focused on how families intentionally transmit a biblical worldview to their children. She presented her study this last October at NAPSI, and I've asked her five times to join our faculty, and she's told me five times no, something about a higher priority of raising her infant son, of being a mother, transmitting a biblical worldview, something, <laughs> something along those lines. But I have heard from all of these friends and colleagues, I have heard all of them speak of Dallas Seminary in golden tones. Uh, I even met a couple of former colleagues that I didn't even know was here, Dr. Bingham and Dr. Blount. And so it's just like coming home and I've never been here before. You've made me feel, <laughs> made me feel uh, very welcomed. I am honored by your invitation. I have been doing a great deal of reading in the area of brain research and its implications for the teaching learning process. So I thought I would share with you some of my recent discoveries. Uh, we'll also consider a few passages of scripture uh, that tie into the topic a little bit later. Uh, today is Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> I wish you and your loved one I just wondered if that error message was up there on the screen. It's Satan, it's just. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's off, go away, technical help. Huh? Any ideas? <laughs> Murmuring, murmuring. <laughs> it's. Make the selection. Go to that. Go to that. Put that on that pod. Drop it. I made the selection. No, up there. Up, up top in the box. Right there. Yeah. Away. Away. My wireless is turned off. There we go. I've only worked with computers for 25 years and I've only worked with Windows for 20 years. It's the same old thing. I'm thinking about buying a Macintosh. If you have any advice, let me know afterwards. Mac Pro, okay. Anyway, I wish you and yours a very special today, today on Valentine's Day. My sweetheart and I celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary two weeks ago. <clears throat> and we still love each other. <laughs> I read the other day of a neuroscientist who in a moment of personal openness with a fellow scientist confessed that it often frustrated him and sometimes angered him that the deep and abiding love he had for his wife was explained by his chosen profession, neuroscience, solely in terms of the biochemistry of his brain and nerve endings in his internal organs. <clears throat> he made this complaint privately, of course, because, su <clears throat> because objections such as these were still enough in the 1990s to end a career in neuroscience. So he lived in two worlds. In his professional world, he relegated all mental and emotional function, all consciousness, all mind and soul, to brain cells, neurons, and deterministic electrochemical reactions. But in his personal world, he lived a rich life of self-awareness, freedom, choice, and love. 
Over the last 10 years, the gap between mechanical brain processes and humanical thought processes has narrowed. In 1995, when I was working on Created to Learn, the study of the brain and brain function, the neurosci neuroscience was adamant, uh, despite contradictory research findings here and there, that the brain was basically fixed in structure and function at an early age. While neuroscientists scientists conceded that the contents of the brain certainly change throughout life, senior adults can still learn things, they held firmly to the idea that the basic structure, the wiring, the components, the regions of functionality of the brain were set in place early on. Last year, when Broadman Holman decided it was time for me to update my textbook, I prepared for my sabbatical writing assignment uh, by looking at this area of brain-based learning. And when I opened that door this last fall, I walked headlong into a tidal wave of books and articles attempting to connect brain research with learning and living. I thought I'd just share some of those with you briefly. Here's a book called The Synaptic Self, How Our Brains Become Who We Are, 2002. Synapses, the spaces between the neurons, that's the empty space, are the channels through which we think, act, imagine, feel, and remember. In short, they enable us, each of us, to function as a single integrated individual from moment to moment, from year to year. You are your synapses. Well, he goes into a little more detail than that, but <clears throat> you are the empty space between neurons. Here's a book that purports to explain the brain, the most complex uh, entity in the universe. And it does so it, with outdated illustrations and outdated findings. Uh, the findings, most of the findings in this book have already been shown to be inaccurate. In fact, that's part of the problem with the study as we are making discoveries every day that show that we're wrong, that we were wrong yesterday. Here's a book, The Executive Brain, Frontal Lobes in the Civilized Mind. The frontal lobes are the most recently evolved region of the brain. They are crucial for all, for all high order functioning and hold the key to our judgment, our social and ethical behavior, our imagination, indeed to our soul. Your soul is located right there in those frontal lobes. <laughs> Protect them. Defining, <coughs> defining right and wrong in brain science. What, the, what can brain scans tell us about our capacity for moral reasoning and whether individuals are able or unable to control their impulses when they act? Can we actually control ourselves? We don't know, we have to scan our brains. <laughs> we'll find out. Um, God said, thou shalt not. Uh, he assumed that we could. Uh, here's a Paulist Press uh, book, uh, Catholic education book, Religious Education in the Brain, uh, 2000 book. I, I put this here because it is an illustration of how fast things are changing. Uh, the diagram that you see up here points out the regions of the brain where smell and hearing and speech and, and so forth uh, exist, but all of this has been shown to be um, quite primitive. Uh, because if any of these areas are damaged, other areas of the brain can pick up, particularly for young children. In fact, one of the treatments for epilepsy, severe ep epilepsy, is just to remove half of the brain. They just cut the brain in half. And for younger children, there seems to be no uh, damage to their functioning. Left brain, right brain, you can only do this, you can only do that. No, 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 the brain just rewires itself. And it just goes right on. They go to college and they do quite well. And if they don't tell anybody that they only have half a brain, nobody would ever guess. <laughs> How the brain learns. Here's an educational psychology text that marries educational theory with recent discoveries about the brain. And as many of these books do, brain research is here and educational implications here. But making the connections between the two uh, prove quite difficult. And then Eric Jensen is a prolific writer in the, in the area, and he's moved into brain-based instructional methods. Since the brain learns in a certain way, then we, should ought, we ought to teach in uh, certain ways. And we can, we can listen, and we can sort through, and we might 
find some helpful uh, suggestions. But the bottom line, primarily, is that the brain is so complex and we know so little about it that we need to be very cautious before we buy into any kind of instructional or learning theory based basically on brain research. The more I read, the more I wonder, is this brain-based phenomenon, this emphasis on neurons and synapses and processes at the molecular level really helpful to us as teachers, as preachers, as pastors, as counselors? Or is it just another educational fad, like instructional television of the 1950s, talking heads on a television screen that was going to replace teachers in the classroom? It didn't. Or computerized uh, education in the 1960s and 70s that was gonna replace live teachers in the classroom, uh, but it didn't. Um, Perhaps it would be helpful uh, to lay out where neuroscience actually fits into the overall spectrum of disciplines of Christian education. Aristotle has observed that the world consists of two elements, matter and the form that it takes. From this observation, he developed his form matter hypothesis, often illustrated by a triangle. At the base of the triangle, he placed matter without form, the very earth beneath our feet. Ascending the triangle, matter takes greater form from dirt uh, to rocks and from rocks to plants and simple organisms and from simple organisms to animals and then higher to human beings and then higher to angels and finally we, we come to the pinnacle of pure form <clears throat> which is God who exists as spirit. Using this kind of hierarchy we can look at or picture man as follows. And here we see at the bottom the brain and the nervous system. Next is the mind and then the spirit as we move upward. The gap you see between the brain and the mind represents a barrier between the physical functioning of the brain which operates according to fixed laws of physics and the mental functioning of the mind which seems not to. Physiology is the general study of living organisms and the functions of those organisms. And in terms of education, we talk about kinetic learning and the environment and movement and how this affects learning. Neuroscience focuses on the physiology of the brain. What are the physical characteristics of the brain? How does the brain function? How does the brain learn? And is the brain different from me? That's a philosophical question. Philosophy is the love of wisdom, the study of metaphysics, what is real, the study of epistemology, what is true and how do we know, axiology, what is right, ethics, what is beautiful, aesthetics. Philosophy focuses on the work of the mind. And to these three fundamental questions, philosophy of education adds five more. What is the teacher? What is the learner? What is the method? What is the outcome? What is the social impact? Such rational questions are important for Christian education as we embrace viewpoints that resonate in the character of God and in his word and reject those that do not. Psychology is the study of the soul or the individual. Why do individuals behave as they do? And how do thought processes work? And what causes emotional states? Psychology grew out of a marriage between physiology and philosophy. The earliest psychological theories of learning were behavioral and defined learning as physical stimulus response bonds stamped into the nervous system by experience, tangible satisfaction, and repetition. Later theories, both cognitive and humanistic, focused on rational and emotional types of learning, focusing on the mind. The spiritual aspect of human life is connection with God through faith and prayer. It is the God-shaped hole in every human being that can only be filled by a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Theology is the study of God and his characteristics, his works, and his word. Christian education draws from all of these areas in order to create an optimal learning environment 
in order to draw the lost to Christ, to stimulate growth in the Lord, to disciple believers into a kingdom lifestyle so that they not only quote scripture, but they actually live scripture. They not only know the Bible, but they are biblical in the way they live. And then to carry these truths to the whole world through ministry, evangelism, and missions. But today, we focus on the brain and neuroscience. July 17, 1990, President H.W. Bush declared 1990 to 2000 to be the decade of the brain. He anchored the importance of brain research to overcoming a variety of diseases, and you will find most research into brain, uh, most research into brain functioning has to do with brain non-functioning or problems with brain functioning. Diseases such as Alzheimer's, as well as stroke, schizophrenia, autism, the impairments of speech and language and hearing, drug addiction, uh, AIDS, and the like. While the focus of the proclamation did not mention positive brain functioning and normal educational processes, the proclamation and the money Congress put behind it generated a great deal of research. And this research has been grasped by educators in order to uh, find connections to how we might teach. One branch of neuroscience focused on the role of DNA in the genetic code, proposing that all human behavior could be reduced to genes. That is, human behavior is determined at conception by the genetic code one inherited. Two of the more outlandish suggestions during the 1990s were a homosexual gene to explain why some people were born gay, and a God gene <clears throat> to explain why some people are more religious than others. That was the Time magazine cover in October in 2004, the God gene. And we'll talk more about that at the brown bag if you're interested in those two genes. But suffice it to say, uh, that was a dead end. There are only 35,000 genes present in the human DNA, and only half of those are active in the brain, but there are, ten, there are 100 billion neurons or brain cells in the human brain, 100 billion with a B. And each of those are connected to a few thousand up to 100,000 neurons each, making 100 trillion connections. Some put the number at 1,000 trillion connections in an adult human brain. 1,000 trillion, a million billion, a billion million. It's a big number. The human brain is the most complex entity in the universe. It is mathematically impossible for 18,000 genes to control the growth of these connections. Our DNA is simply too limited to spell out the wiring diagram for the human brain. What has been found that does control that development is our experience with the world in which we live. But the problem of studying that has met with its own difficulties. Due to the brain's complexity, as well as the rapid advance of medical technology, researchers are making discoveries every day that force fundamental changes in what we understand. In the 70s, it was an accepted fact that the structure and wiring of the human brain was fixed, hardwired, like an electronic calculator by the age of six. Didn't change after that. Fundamental structure, the wiring together of billions of neurons, no longer pliable, no longer plastic, neuroplasticity after the age of six. By the 1980s, discoveries were made that plasticity continued way into adolescence. And in the last five years, studies have shown beyond any doubt through PET scans and MRI imaging that the, chip, that the brain continues to change throughout the entire lifespan. The brain never stops changing in structure or wiring. The brain never stops changing. What causes it to change and what shape does it take? That has been the one element of all the reading I've done over the last several months that is the most surprising to me and the one that I wanted to focus on this morning. Because it has been scientifically verified that our brains change simply as a result of where we focus our attention. One of the most fascinating books I've read in recent months is Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz's book, The Mind and the Brain, Neuroplasticity and the Power of Mental Force, uh, 2002. 
In the 1980s, Schwartz Passion was working with obsessive compulsive disorders, people who wash their hands all the time is a common example. He found behavioral approaches to treating OCD, dehumanizing, bring samples of your own waste from home, rub it on yourself, and then don't allow the patient to wash. Sit there for a while, covered in your own waste. I won't go into any more detail than that. He was uh, sickened by it and wanted to find a better way to help patients overcome their obsessive thoughts. He also happened to be a student of Buddhism, a naturalistic religion of the mind, and this led him to consider a focused mental approach to OCD. Here's uh, what he found, basically. You can see in this uh, brain circuits involving three areas of the brain, there is a thought that comes into the brain to wash hands, and it fires over and over and over. It is a dysfunction of the brain. The brain has faulty wiring, and this circuit is overactive, and you can just tell the person not to wash the hands, but the longer they do not wash their hands, the stronger the obsessive thought becomes uh, until it just drives them crazy. They have to wash their hands. And so what he began to do was provide them therapy through focusing on another idea, another concept, something else they could do when this obsessive thought came to them. In, in this case, uh, to go to the garden, to go out to the garden, smell the flowers, whatever. And to focus on that thought. Uh, early in therapy, the, the hand washing was far more powerful and so usually the patients continued to do that but they continued to focus on another, another aspect. He goes into all kinds of quantum physics, which I won't bore you with here, and we don't have time for anyway, but there is a decision to be made and how a person can, with mental force, make one decision or the other is, is crucial to the process. But as the idea of going to the garden rather than washing hands is focused upon, that actually creates a new circuit in the brain that didn't exist before, go to the garden. When you, when you think this thought, go to the garden. The mind is creating a tangible biological change in the meat of the brain, something that neuroscience five years ago said couldn't happen. And as this is practiced over and over again, this new circuit becomes stronger and stronger and the old circuit begins to weaken. And then, there comes a time when the OCD patient can now act on this thought to actually go to the garden and by putting, it in, putting this thought into action strengthens other circuitry to, to strengthen those circuits more than the old dysfunctional ones. The wise man hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, Jesus said. And so over time, the new brain circuitry takes over the old brain circuitry goes away, and the OCD patient is healed. 80% success rate. The old behavioral approaches of rubbing your waist on yourself uh, had a 30% success rate, and that was only the 50% of patients who would put up with that kind of treatment. What we give our focused attention to changes the actual structure and wiring of our brains. Over time, we create a brain that reflects our choices. Mental effort has the power to alter biological matter significantly. Schwartz concludes his book this way. The neurons that pack our brain at the moment of birth continue to weave themselves into circuits throughout our lives. The real estate that the brain devotes to this activity rather than that one, to this part of the body rather than that one, even to this mental habit rather than that one is mutable, changeable. As, it's as changeable as the map of congressional districts in the hands of gerrymanderers. The life we lead, in other words, leaves, it, this is his words, the life we lead, in other words, leaves its mark in the form of enduring changes in the complex circuitry of the brain, footprints of the experiences we have had, the actions we have taken. Now listen to these scriptures. In light of these words, and God spoke all these words, 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Attend to me and to no other. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Do not divide your attentions on idols. Focus on me. Attend to me and me alone. David wrote in Psalm 119, 9 and 11, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word, putting the word into practice day by day. I seek you with all my heart. Attention, focused attention. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart. That's it, before me that I might not sin against you. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, focused attention for righteousness. What is the result? They shall be filled with righteousness. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated. Your heart, your passion, your devotion, your priority. Set them on on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. Salvation, victory in Christ, forgiveness, love for others, freedom to minister, spiritual gifts, church community, spiritual growth. Focus on these things and not on earthly things. Self is number one, fear, success, anger, ambition, fame, pornography, astrology, entertainment. Where do you focus? Where do I focus my mind? Again, Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6 to 8, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Reject the negative. Embrace the positive. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why? Because where we put our focus determines what we will ultimately become in this life. What about after this life? We have provided evidence that the mind has power over the brain. But can the mind exist without the brain? Not in the physical realm. My mother lost her her mind in the physical realm through a triple stroke. And she was no longer the person that she once was. Stroke, disease, injury, degeneration, all these destroy brain tissue and brain function and the mind is lost, at least in this physical realm, but yet we know that God's mind exists and he doesn't have a brain at all. And we know his mind exists because he speaks to us, mind to mind. I have a story about my wife who nearly died in the hospital, but I don't have time to tell it, so come to the brown bag. (laughs) God speaks to us, mind to mind. He speaks to us through his word, As we faithfully act on his direction, we physically change our brains to think God's way, and the more we focus on him, the more efficiently, the more effectively we are able to think his thoughts and understand his ways. I have studied brain research, but I am no neuroscientist. I have studied and taught philosophy, but I am no philosopher. I have graduate degrees in educational psychology, but I am no psychologist. I am a teacher, and everything I read and study, I focus on the function of how can I convey life to my students in such a way that they can grow in the Lord. As Christian teachers, we focus the minds of our students on him, to know his words and commands, to understand his perspective, to analyze problems in life according to his direction, to evaluate right and wrong according to his standards. It's not about giving lectures, it's about engaging learners mind to mind. As teachers, we focus our students' hearts on the values of the kingdom, love rather than revenge, forgiveness rather than grudges, patience versus anger, discipline versus laxness. As teachers, we focus our students' attention on kingdom behaviors, 
Honesty versus deceit. Truth versus falsehood. Hard work versus laziness. Obedience versus self-centered choices. And at the very center of our teaching ministry is Christ. We lead our students to follow the ruler, not merely his rules. And in doing so, as we lead them to give focused attention to the thoughts and the values and the actions of Christ, our Savior and Lord, they change the very shape, form, function, and wiring of a hundred thousand billion neurons. And the portion that is taken over by God's perspective increases, and the portion programmed through life experiences with self-doubt, self-hate, anger, malice, and sin decreases. And we can take pictures of it while it happens. We can map the changes as physical footprints in our brains. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. May God bless you as you give yourself first to the Lord and then to those you teach for as long as the Lord allows to his glory. Thank you.